Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Star Freud Wellness Podcast. I am your host, Star Friedenberg, and if it's your first time tuning into this podcast, welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the cult. <laughs> uh, I'm just joking, but obviously, uh, in some similar fashion, um, really welcome to subscribing to this uh, channel, this podcast, and I hope I can add some value to your life today. And uh, what I like to do is just obviously share some information, my personal life experiences, um, what I'm learning in clinic uh, from wonderful people that are coming through that are teaching me a lot. So I'm very grateful, as well as on all the teachings that I am doing uh, throughout my studies throughout the world as part of my life discipline and dedication to doing my best to be a healer and to help people. So I'm very excited to always share this information with you. And uh, for today's podcast, I want to talk about, as I always say in my podcast, I have a lot of themes that are coming into the clinic sort of um, over a certain period of time, whether it's weeks or months. Um, but I have quite a couple of new, I haven't had um, on a regular basis, a number of themes of types of people coming through at the moment, but I do actually have this for the first time. And um, I would say, what is what is happening in the clinic at the moment? A lot of people presenting with candida. A lot of people presenting with some neurodiverse learning, um, different um, diversity in a sense. So some people with autism, some people with OCD, some people on different um, ends of the spectrum. Um, so it's really fascinating on how I have learned about people suffering, or well, maybe suffering is not the right word, but people um, experiencing being different, or maybe I would class as normal and we're different, um, and really how that is quite linked to just some str straightforward standard vitamin deficiencies and things like that. And again, I'm being privileged that people are letting me um, explore with them some theories of mine that I come up with lots of all these individual unique theories and theoretically it's called research and just seeing like the quite a big transformation in terms of uh, grounding, being able to function, the cognition, um, being able to sleep better um, and being able to think better. So mental performance and mental clarity. Um, what else am I seeing? I'm seeing a, seeing a lot of scoliosis. Um, so that's sort of the deformity in the spine. And obviously when the spine is out, the posture is out, the organs are out and everything else is out. Um, what else am I seeing? And I guess basically um, there's, there's a couple more. I can't think off the top of my head. Maybe I should have written it down. Sorry. Um, but the main theme um, at the moment, and it's not new in general, but it's just a lot of recurring people at the moment is really relating to the subject of today's uh, podcast, which is to deal with iron deficiency. So if you are iron deficient, the most... Um, common term you will hear is anemia right so someone will say I am anemic and that's obviously very very popular I would say more popular than ever probably on the planet's history or era because of um, mainly the lifestyle choices that people are making being vegan or vegetarian so you know the predominant issue with anemia is the lack of iron um, which means a lack of food sources that supplement iron which we'll get from just for example red meat um, or different nutritional, nutritional deficiencies so um, because a lot of people are making a ethical or a health-based decision not to eat meat um, then obviously as a result of it they're not supplementing or getting a, enough iron um, into their body and then obviously because I'm an expert in gut health and just obviously seeing the knock the negative knock-on effects that if you have poor gut health um, you know that's just going to affect every outcome of your health in your body and uh, I always say this I think maybe if I if I don't become famous for saying this um, then I don't know what I'm doing with my life. But um, gut health affects everything. Really, really, really. And this is my phrase. If you fix your gut, you fix your life. <laughs> I should probably, when I, write a, when I write my gut book, I'm going to write like, that's the quote, you know, catch my cat phrase, my catch phrase. 
if you fix your gut, you can fix your life. Um, and I really, really do seriously mean that because I will, I will say this a million times. So sorry if you're bored of it already, but if, um, from everywhere I've studied around the world, all the different medical studies and systems and modalities and alternative therapies, really, truly, honestly, deeply, everything is stemming from the gut. And you got to think about it, whatever you're putting in, that's affecting your gut. And that's affecting the decisions you make. That's affecting the hormones you make. That's affecting your moods. That's affecting uh, the way you're going to sleep. That's affecting your posture is going to be. I mean, it is so fundamental. It's unreal. And I think why I think I get better results from people. And I always say that I attract the weird and the wonderful people with rare autoimmune conditions, people who've been rejected by the NHS, people that have been written off by the NHS, people that won't even be seen by the NHS, um, that are just basically told, you know, in summary, you're broken, we can't help you. Um, and this is just going to be your life for the rest of it. So, um, and it's a bit fright, it is a bit frightening. A lot of people, that are with white coats, <laughs> the white coat people, um, they don't really know what gut health is about and they don't really know what colonic hydrotherapy is and they don't really know that if you have poor gut health, what that will do. And they don't really know the magnitude that stress will have on the guts. And it's just a bit weird because I think, what are these people learning? <laughs> but anyway, uh, let me not digress. We're going back onto iron, <laughs> iron deficiency, right? So one very important thing that I think is really good to know, and that can be your fun fact of the day that you can share with people is we have an organ in our body called the liver. And everyone will have heard of this word, but not really many people know what this thing does and where it is in the body. But if you just want to know, just a quick fun fact, it's on the right hand side of your body, um, sort of kind of under the rib cage, under your breast, um, if you're a woman, or under your pectoral muscle, if you're a man, sort of, sort of if you place your thumb towards the edge of where your breast um, would be, or under would be hanging, <laughs> uh, where your hand would be placed. It's, it's sitting sort of around there. For me, <laughs> I describe it like a big piece of fillet steak. It's on average between 1.4 kilograms. And it is a very, very important organ. It's a major organ. And uh, it's also the only organ in the body that can regenerate itself, which is also fascinating. So if you do bad, <laughs> there is still some hope for you. Um, but it's also a magnificent organ. And if not, in my opinion, the most superior organ of the body, but it is responsible for more than 500 functions. And I mean, I didn't even know our body could do that many functions, but that one organ alone is responsible for a lot of functions. Um, and in context of this podcast today, he is responsible for making blood, right? And I always like to remember Mr. Liver as the organ that is the organ that holds all of our toxins. He's the almost like I describe him to my clients or patients as a porous sponge, and he will just hold on to all of your toxicity. So it can be from not drinking enough water to being extremely stressed to consuming or over consuming pharmaceuticals down to recreational drugs and abuse of drugs down to smoking down to poor diet down to oily foods processed foods um and obviously in summary the combination of all of the above at various times in your life and you know when you're younger you do a lot more stupid things and when you're older you're paying for it because the organ is like hey man, like, I'm a bit tired now, like, you know, I've been doing your, I've been piggybacking you a whole long time, but at the moment, I'm just going to tell you that I need a little bit of support. So as being a very serious, powerful master organ, if not the most superior organ of the body, we got to look after our liver. And now when the liver, um, we could say is at an imbalance and I like to use the word imbalance rather than it's bad or not working because I think the power of our language is quite important but when the liver is at an imbalance you might find that you tend towards having low iron right maybe because the functionality of the creation of your blood's not at its best something's going on with the cells I'm not sure right 
But what I've also come to learn for me, and again, this is what happens with time when you sort of in a field, is things become so second nature and obvious to you. And I am being humbly reminded on a daily basis that what is obvious to me is not obvious to the general public. So I think or have thought that every no, everyone would know what an iron deficiency is or being anemic means. And I've come to learn people don't. So this is the point of my podcast today is I'm here to create some information on some basics and hopefully then everyone will have a general basis of knowledge. Right. So we go with the first question. What is iron deficiency anemia? Iron deficiency anemia is a type of anemia that develops if you do not have enough iron in your body. It is the most common type of anemia. Now, what are the symptoms of this? So people with mild or moderate iron deficiency anemia may not have any symptoms. So I have seen a lot of people that are able to function um, without realizing it, but they just sort of say like, yeah, I just kind of feel tired and don't feel like I can do as much as I want to do. Um, but we're going on more now of the extreme amounts of the more serious iron deficiency anemia symptoms. And that will be tiredness, shortness of breath, or even chest pain. So often people might confuse this with having a heart attack or something like this. But remember the heart's cardiovascular system. So it's dealing with blood. So obviously if you have a shortage of blood or blood that's not circulating properly, they'll have some different knock-on effects. So um, it's always good, obviously, you know, first rule, and I mean, this should maybe, maybe not be obvious knowledge, but if you start to experience so many chest pains or struggling to breathe or shortness of breath, it's like the grounds to be calling um, the ambulance or getting yourself straight to hospital or calling on someone you love or nearby you that can help you if you are concerned. Right. Um, another very uh common symptom that people don't know about and I love it because it makes me think of being in the UK um, in the underground in the tube and when you are <laughs> at the bottom coming up the tube and your face to go up an escalator and you just look up and it just feels like the escalator is as long as as, as if it is going to heaven and I just think gosh you know got a bloody step up that now especially when the elevators are off it uh, escalators are off it's just like oh and then you have your 12 kilogram bag of things with you as well. Or at least I do. I carry a lot of things, especially when I'm going to the clinic. But um, another common symptom that most people don't realize is when you are walking um, and you're walking, climbing up some stairs. So basically you're having to lift your legs um, and move them up to a higher incline. I hope I said that right. <laughs> you're inclining more and you're struggling to lift your legs and you start to experience the sense of heaviness in your legs this is also another e very obvious and common sign of um, iron deficiency so usually when I say to people like oh do you struggle and they're like yeah how do you know like it's very heavy I just feel like I can't lift my legs it's like these heavy tree stumps <laughs> um it's not because you're fat it's because you're iron deficient so that's quite <laughs> that's quite a compliment uh, that people go oh thank goodness right um but like I say the common symptoms or other symptoms include dizziness um not sorry dizziness fatigue and the next one will be dizziness or lightheadedness so sometimes people might um just for example from waking up in the morning they'll be laying down all night and they sit up um usually if it's quickly you'll be more noticed you'll notice the symptoms a lot more like oh I feel a bit lightheaded dizziness slightly faint etc um or even if it's not fast and that happens, that can also just be more of an indication of different um, level of um, deficiency is the right way to say. Another common sign is, um, not sign or symptom, is cold hands and feet. So people go like, oh, you know, my body's always cold and my body's always warm, but my hands and feet always get cold. Um, so this can just obviously just for um, <laughs> uh, obvious purposes to just uh, elaborate again. A lot of different conditions can have a lot of uh, similar symptoms. So just because I've said cold hand and feet doesn't mean now like you're iron deficient. You know, maybe you should think about ticking a little a few more boxes um, because there can be a crossover with symptoms. Right. And another most obvious one is pale skin. So I like to call it 
do they look like a vampire? You can see that, um, and maybe even you can see from the face to the body that there is a mismatch in terms of coloration. Um, you can just see this like tiredness look on someone's body. Like it doesn't look normal for them to look that tired. And sometimes it can be pale. And this will be more noticeable for when you are around your loved ones, your family, your friends. Because they'll be like, oh, you're looking a bit pale today. Um, but usually I'm a bit weird. I can feel when I feel pale, which I think is strange. But maybe that's why I'm in the work that I am because I'm a big observer. But usually it'll be a good sign for people to go, okay, you're looking a bit different today. Are you okay? And that's another thing I think about makeup is makeup is a very good mask, um, which can then mislead how you're looking in terms of then being an indication of how you're feeling as well. So um, especially if you go in to see a professional and you're concerned about these symptoms and things. I mean, when obviously I work with Asian medicine as well with Tibetan and Chinese medicine. So we look at factors of looking at your face, the coloration, if there's any um, patches of certain colors, we're looking for the eye bags, we're looking for the color under the eyes, we're looking um, at the eyelids, we're looking at the tongue, I'm looking in your ears, um, I'm looking in your eyes. So there's lots of things. So if you're going to come to see me or slash go see another healthcare practitioner, please be mindful maybe on this day not to wear makeup because actually can be to your detriment because maybe people um, won't be um, in a position to notice the obvious signs that would be dictating this. Okay, so most people say, you know, well, what causes this? What causes iron deficiency? So your body needs iron to make healthy red blood cells and conditions that increase the risk of iron deficiency include the following. So blood loss is number one. So now I'm going to go into my phlebotomy knowledge. So let's see how much I remember here. So on average, a human, an adult human, really an adult, <laughs> not an adult human, an adult um, will, again, depending on your height, produce on average between four to seven litres of blood. And that's constantly circulating throughout the body. And now, if we with a certain amount of blood, if you have or do experience some form of blood loss, you're going to be losing iron because iron is within the red blood cells, right? And of course, blood loss can happen in many ways. And we're going to think of the most common one in terms of females. That's going to be heavy menstrual periods or bleeding during childbirth as well. Um, and women who have different gynecological health issues, maybe fibroids, endometriosis. Um, those are the couple, couple of them thinking off the top of my head, but different reasons that you're having a heavy bleed or heavier than normal bleed. You can be um, losing a lot more blood than you should. And that also will put you at grounds of being more deficient with your iron. Um, and usually patients I see with different female health um, conditions are either on regular iron drips on high dosage uh, iron supplements, having to eat a lot of red meat, etc., like that. Right, so that's one reason. Bleeding in your gastrointestinal tract is another one, which is from different inflammatory bowel diseases or ulcers or unfortunate the colon cancer, which is the second um, highest ranking cancer. Or you can have other GI, so GI gastrointestinal tract disorders such as celiac disease as well. So different things can be traumatic injuries or surgery. Um, the most I think as I do Brazilian jiu-jitsu, I think of um, your nose being broken, which I had mine broken twice. Uh, was it last year? Was it the year before? Yeah, I had it broken twice. Um, yeah, it was the year before. Two, year, <laughs> two years ago, I had my nose broken. Um, and it's a very popular way for your nose to bleed and you can lose a lot of blood. Um, or maybe you can have a, a car accident or you can fall off something or, you know, a high risk injury um, that can result in a lot of blood loss. Um, and the same for having surgery. Then another is a regular use of medica medication or medicine, right? So we're thinking aspirin or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs, NSAIDs, 
that's how people pronounce it, um, such as ibuprofen, sorry, I couldn't even say this word, ibuprofen and naproxen that can lead to GI tract bleeding. So just so you know, when people have like strokes or any heart issues or cardiovascular conditions, one popular regular prescribed medication um, and it will be prescribed because you can buy aspirin in the shops or OTC over the counter, but you'll get a high level of prescription that's used. And aspirin is a blood thinner. So therefore, if you cut yourself or anything like that, your blood's not going to clot as easily and you're going to bleed a lot longer and a lot more. And also, just so you know, from the gut health perspective, aspirin is quite naughty because aspirin can basically cause um, ulcers in your gut because it eats the lining or the intestinal lining. Um, so you need to be careful about either taking it for a prolonged period of time um, and also to make sure when you um, do take aspirin, and most people probably going to hear this now be like, oh my God, I've been taking aspirin like for X amount of years and I didn't know this. <laughs> now you know, right? So you can't go back on this. Um, you need to buffer it, right? So one is you need to always be taking a probiotic to really um, create a good gut health uh, environment, microbiome, and to protect your GI tract, your gastrointestinal tract, and always take it after food because at least you'll have the buffer of your food to protect so it doesn't just go and eat the lining of your wall. But if you start to feel pains or any cramping or discomfort, you could be resulting in partial bleed within your, your GI tract. And maybe it, it's sometimes the most often root um, I find in the work that I do with gut health perspective is because people have been on uh, aspirin for a very, very long time. And another big issue I have, um, so when I'm president, I would love um, this sort of rule to be in place. Is there's a problem, um, and maybe it's to do with obviously the shortage of staff, and you know there's many reasons we can justify this, but it shouldn't be justified because it's not good, is that doctors are not in a habit or practice of reviewing prescriptions people go onto a prescription for whatever reason but they're never told you should only be taking this for x amount of time and a lot of drugs should only be taken for x amount of time so um there's you know drugs for example where people take to uh reduce their stomach acids ppis protein pump inhibitors that should only be taken for about six months at maximum and people will be on it for years and that's going to have long-term health implications and People don't know about that. And it's the same with other different types of drugs as well. And what doctors need to be doing is going, and maybe with the help of AI, some things can be put into place from a back-end administrative point of view for people to review their prescriptions. Because people just keep getting a prescription each month. They get their paper, uh, however, what we're in form, and they just keep taking the things without questioning it, just thinking, the doctor said, I need to take this, and they take it. But actually, you need to be more of an inquiring mind and going like, especially now with access to Google, you can Google everything. Google is now the official doctor, isn't it? So just questioning what you're on and why you're on it and how long have you been on it for? And should you still be on it? Do you still experience the symptoms? Do you still feel unwell? And even when it comes to mental health um, medication, you know, for the severe uh, mental health conditions, even that is not fixed. Um Medication needs to constantly be adjusted, whether dosages are slightly increased or decreased. So just being mindful about that. Okay. So maybe another side note from this is maybe you should get your prescription reviewed. So try and make an appointment with your GP um, and see if you still need to be on these things because maybe you might not need to be. Right. And the last reason for blood loss could be urinary tract bleeding as well. So some people pee blood for various reasons. Um, and they can lose they can lose blood in different ways, right? Another reason could also be people. Um, sorry, what? Another reason that people also be uh, can also be suffering with iron deficiency is problems with absorbing iron. Now, now there is a different level. So yes, you're getting your iron, you're consuming your iron, but now your body's not taking it, absorbing it. So. Why does that happen? There are certain conditions or medicines that can decrease your body's availability or bioavailability to absorb iron, which can lead to the deficiency or iron deficiency anemia. 
And these, and this is just a couple um, that I've come up with, but these can include certain rare genetic conditions. So that can block your intestines from absorbing iron or it makes it harder to stop bleeding. Um, Another really fascinating one that I learned a few years ago um, is a condition called hemochromatosis. And basically, people are unwell. They present like... um, a patient with all the symptoms of iron deficiency and then they'll just follow the standard white coat example of they'll get an iron test done a blood test done and the doctor will be like you're fine actually you've got enough iron in your body when they take a sample of your blood but then it turns out it's this vicious condition that um, leads also uh, to macular degeneration so you can lead to blindness when you get older where your body is just not allocating the blood properly or not transporting it to the right places properly. And what it does is it starts to settle in in different people that I've treated. It settles in different places of choice, but usually a preference of an organ. And then basically it will put too much blood in that organ and it just gets stuck there and it rots. And basically your organ rusts due to the iron overload um, hasn't really been uh, concluded on how to be treated and there's a lot of things that people have to do but the main one is just trying to cut your iron consumption um, they do bloodletting therapy so they'll go um, get blood taken out of them so often like to do a blood donation but usually because of this condition it accompanies a lot of different um, health issues so maybe the blood's not always the best to donate um, so sometimes it's just trash the blood really um, and then obviously different types of things, knock on effects that come, but I've seen a lot of arthritic kind of conditions associated. I've seen other people with a lot of uh, skin conditions like eczema, psoriasis, um, and like I say, blindness as well, or arthritic. So yeah, it can be quite vicious, but not nice. Um, another reason to the problem with absorbing iron can be endurance sports. So I always think of the uh, long distance running athletes. So it can make athletes lose their iron through the GI tract. And I say gastrointestinal tract. I like to say GI because it's quicker. And through the breakdown of red blood cells. So if you're overdoing it and, you know, again, I like this word imbalance. We want to be in balance, but we become out of balance when we overdo something. So something good in excess can also become a bad thing. So I always use the common example of, you know, going to gym it's good. Going to gym 15 times in one week, it's not good. (laughs) So we just got to be mindful. So certain people, um, and I had a case of this last week, actually. So a woman is a long distance runner, absolute passion, um, running ultra marathons, you know, really pushing her body. Um, But due to the breakdown in her cells um, and the over um, requirement of energy expenditure, and not sufficiently or nutritionally supporting that output um, has been unable now to, and has had a miscarriage and been unable to remain pregnant because not enough nutrition in her body because of her choice of sport. So now it's this conflicting decision. It's like, well, if you want to have a child, right, then you need to maybe bring your passion back into balance because that was an excess too but I mean if you're an athlete that doesn't want to have kids different game but then you need to consider um, when you're older what kind of long-term impact that's going to have on your body so it's very important all the decisions we make today we've got to think about what does that equal in output for our future because there are consequences to everything we do um, and it's just being mindful and aware and intentional with the decisions we make. Do you know what the potential consequences can be when you're older? And this is the classic case now. Everyone's young, doing alcohol, doing drugs, party, 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 abusing the body, not sleeping, overdoing it, bad lifestyle, bad habits. You're fine now, but I'm treating all the people who are those future selves, um, and they're very, very unwell. And all I can say is there's just constant regret. Like, I wish I didn't do that. I wish I knew back then. Da, 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 da. So just being mindful of that. Right. Next reason is intestinal and digestive conditions. So we have something called celiac disease, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, helibacter pylori infection as well, which attacks um, in the small intestine. 
And then another one is parasites. <laughs> my favorite subject. Parasites. Many, I have many favorite subjects, actually. I don't know why I say that. <laughs> I don't have a favorite. I like too many things. But um, and parasites as well. Parasites because they'll be, again, their main primary function is taking over the host. So they'll be consuming all your nutrition and health. So they will then take over and then they'll basically eat everything within you that will support their life. Um, and so anemia iron deficiency is quite popular and common I notice um, as well when I do gut health work or gut health aspects the next one is surgery on your stomach and intestines as well which includes weight loss surgery so very very common I see so again despite talking about um, blood (laughs) there's a lot of um, gut health involvement in why there's problems now other medical conditions so other medical conditions can also um, cause iron deficiency and this can include kidney disease so people who have kidney disease do not make enough substance called erythropoietine <laughs> I can never say these words erythropoietine so your body needs this to make red blood cells um, and your doctor may prescribe this if you have kidney disease so you can have literally a medical condition that's making an iron issue and long-lasting conditions that can lead to inflammation. So these can include congestive heart failure or obesity, and they can make it hard for your body to regulate um, and use your body's iron as well. So again, it's very common that as a consequence of not being able to absorb, you can have health conditions or as a result of having health conditions can lead you to have poor iron absorption. So sometimes even young children can even develop anemia. Um, because they don't typically get enough diet, uh, so iron in their diet. And this usually occurs from, I think, about nine months or so and one year um, as a child transitions to eating whole foods. So again, this also can be as a result of um, early stages of life uh, and just being more mindful. But in my case, um, I'm from South Africa. So basically, you know, I was eating meat as soon as I left the womb. Um, and then on a funny note, my mom said that she never used to feed me, um, what you call it, pureed food. Um, she said she used to blend uh, like steak and mash um, and all those goody things um, in the blender. And then that's what, what she would feed me as a child. So I've always thought, I wonder what kind of positive effects that's had that I was eating proper, strong quality food um, from birth. Um, versus someone eating like straight out of the tin or the can or the bottle um, where it just might have been like a couple of fruits and things and not really strong um, nutrient dense foods so you know I don't know I love iron I love meat so it is the case so I'm sorry for the vegans and vegetarians out there but it is true and I do um, independently say that you know I have experienced being vegan for five years I'm sure I've said that somewhere in another podcast or podcasts um due to being convinced about it with in um the spiritual community when I was you know making my path and journey into becoming more of a healer and an energetic worker and being told that if I wanted to connect better with source and spirit then you know you will only be accepted in the pearly gates if you were a vegan um but I experienced some health impact and issues as a result of that. And, you know, having worked with my uh, gut health practitioner saying that, you know, my stools were not correct and I'm always tired all the time and I just don't feel like I used to. Um, what is it? And she just said, well, you're South African and you were raised on meat and now that's what your vehicle runs on. And you just thought to put diesel into your vehicle. And I thought, Yeah, that's quite true. So she said, you need to go home and eat meat. So I went home and I ate meat. And I definitely felt much better as a person. And, uh, you know, throwing in a few conspiracy theories. So a lot of the top health, um, sorry, the top um, or famous biohackers, not that I follow specifically, but um, because I like to have my own theories and things. And I don't like to be easily influenced because I'm coming to a lot of my own things and maybe in that state in the future I'll be able to um, you know be a leader in what I do and say independently but you know they're saying not eating meat is a fad it's a popular thing at the moment and I can understand for different reasons why people do not eat meat and I think it's one the industry is obviously very compromised and the pharmaceuticals and antibiotics 
antibiotics that uh, you know the animals being fed the process of how they killed and the energetic um aspect behind that and the ethics behind eating um, a different species of animal etc um but i do think for health reasons we need to have a balance in our lives and i do think that incorporates meat does it mean eating meat multiple times a day no but definitely maybe at least once a week if maybe not twice a week um if really pushing it to once a month but there needs to be some form of meat exposure i believe in the body for some time i think because veganism or um anti meat is kind of a newish thing there are so many new age things that are out there at the moment it's unreal um and so many people are, i would say are being torn because we are like at the age of within the internet that that we have too much information and too much um, opposing information as well and most people don't know what to do and what to follow but again it's going to come down to who you are as a person in your body type your constitution your environment your upbringing and really making it customized to you that you know we need to work out what is best for your body rather than just following fads but from what i see and experience unless you're absolutely um contraindicated and have a high meat allergy for whatever reason and there's absolutely all the different other meats are just absolute no-nos then maybe pescatarian um but for me i've noticed you know it's been a struggle convincing a lot of people that in some way and form you need to have something with blood in it which usually relates to having some form of animal uh, product um they're much better for it and it's just sort of an ethical dilemma and debate but a lot of people not eating meat lack an education on how to nutritionally supply themselves um how to look after themselves what to consume how much to consume because sometimes the things you're having there's not enough bioavailability and the most biggest problem that i obviously experience with people is most people are like that's fine i don't have meat i'm going to have an iron supplement but then they have really really bad gut health and then they can't actually absorb the supplements um and then it's kind of like just doing a redundant function and it's then a waste of money it's almost like you might as well throw your tablets down the toilet so we need to just be a lot more mindful of that so what i see time and time again is people with misinformation or misinterpretation of information have become an authority of their own and have decided what they think is good for them rather than going to a health expert in whatever way and field that you know you need um and are just doing things sort of with a level of ignorance and like going to mentor an expert it's really important because once you go to them they can help you and they can put you on the path and they'll tell you if you're right or wrong or what you're doing is correct or what you're doing was good but you know you need to add these couple of things and you really can't undervalue that so really really going to health expert so important because this is our most important asset it's our health our health is our wealth and maybe that's another catchphrase you can associate with me but it is so crucial and people really underestimate it undervalue it and underrecognize it but it's only when people are unwell then they go oh now i have no choice but to invest in this rather when they could do small let's call it small investments throughout the period of their life and keeping them in a maintenance plan they have to go to the immediate detox and sometimes irreversible health plan um which is of course a lot more costly and a lot more detrimental and a lot more stressful. Right. Rant over. <laughs> Back to iron. So, how do you prevent iron deficiency, right? So, obviously in the case of where uh you are deficient and it's not for medical reasons um specifically and more that it's easier to treat from the comfort of your own home or just with a couple of treatments at a health practitioner such as myself. Um, if you are like, for example, with my previous examples, if you're able to treat the causes of your blood loss or the problems with your iron absorption, um, that can lead to this condition, then of course we can treat it. It is also always a good idea to help the body keep iron levels where they need to be by maintaining a healthy diet, and that includes good sources of iron and 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 vitamin C. So. Vitamins are naughty, <laughs> um, or well, health is naughty, but it's like um, a game and a game of chess. You need one thing in place in order for another thing to happen. So you need often certain vitamin to absorb to absorb a different vitamin or mineral, right? And most people don't actually know this, but you need vitamin C to 
absorb iron. You need vitamin D to absorb calcium. And you need vitamin K to absorb vitamin D. So it's all... <laughs> It's, it's a bit naughty, but it is what it is, right? So what does that mean? So a lot of people might be eating enough iron, but not getting the absorption. And they go, I don't know why that's happening. It's like, ah, because actually you're not consuming any form of vitamin C or citrus. So always be mindful when you're having an iron supplement. Does it contain vitamin C? Just check that out. Now, as humans, in this context, humans, we don't naturally produce vitamin C within our body. So we need to get it from an external source, right? Um, and we can think of all different citrus fruits. We can think of a supplement. It doesn't matter. But you need it to absorb iron. So just, it's, sat right, it's coming to my mind. But a fact is, did you know animals can produce it? So dogs can produce up to five grams of vitamin C naturally each day. So they don't need to consume it from other sources. So... And that's why they don't need to. And they can just be happy on pellets and rice and meats. And uh, yeah, it's quite interesting. But um, now if you ask yourself, okay, if I had to consume iron from food, what foods could I get that from? So we can get it from beans, dried fruits, eggs, lean red meats, salmon, iron fortified breads and cereals, peas, tofu, dark green leafy vegetables, Vitamin C rich foods includes oranges, strawberries, tomatoes that can help you absorb iron. I like to think of pomegranates, lemons, limes, um, melon, yeah, grapefruit, I think it's quite good, also good for the heart. Um, and the most important again when it comes to food is just ensuring that when you're feeding your toddler that they get enough solid foods that are rich in iron. Another popular question people ask me is like, how much iron do I need a day? Because some people get, what's that funny brand, um, Floridix. They'll get Floridix and they'll just think, I'm very deficient. I'll just chug the whole bottle. <laughs> um, and just remember, get supplements that are not constipating in nature. If you want to know what's the right supplements, contact me directly and I will send you the link um, of the ones that I think are good. And I've seen good results from with the people that use them. Right. And now the question is, how much iron do I need each day? So the recommendation around uh, daily limits of iron will depend now on your age, your sex, and whether you're pregnant or breastfeeding. So generally a diet that includes beans, dried fruits, eggs, lean red meat, salmon, iron fortified bread, cereals, peas, tofu, and dark green leafy vegetables. I repeated what I've said just so it can just imprint in your brain. Uh, will provide you the iron level that your body needs. Now, a recommendation between children and adults of iron in milligrams per day. So if you're from birth to about six months, as a male child, you'll need, and female, will need 0 0.27 milligrams. If you're anything between seven to 12 months, you'll need 11 milligrams. One to three years, you need seven. Four to eight, you'll need 10 Nine to thirty, and this is between both male and female. It's only really once uh, a girl hits puberty and starts menstruating, then the differences will show. Um, so four to eight will be ten. Nine to thirteen years old will be eight milligrams, and then fourteen to eighteen year old for male will be eleven milligrams, and fifteen milligrams for female. When between that age group, if you're pregnant, you need twenty-seven milligrams, and if you're breastfeeding, you need ten. When you're between the ages of 19 years old to 50, you as a male, you need eight. And as a female, you'll need 18. And pregnancy and breastfeeding, pregnancy will be 27 milligrams and nine milligrams if you're breastfeeding. 51 years or older, as a male, you need eight. And female, you'll need eight as well. And that will come back down to, generally speaking, that's the normal age of where women will be menstruating, uh, sorry, not menstruating, hitting menopause. And through menopause, they will no longer be menstruating um, and therefore there will be conservation of that blood. And I always say to women going through that time or that phase in their life um, to be mindful of what you're consuming because your body now is no longer releasing iron um, as the system is used to. So you need to be aware that maybe, because women tend to over consume iron to obviously 
um, support that nutritional deficiency that would have happened because of menstruation. It's in actually just being more mindful to reduce that, maybe reduce your iron supplements and reduce the things that are um, very nutritionally dense in iron, right? So how does an iron deficiency get diagnosed? So to diagnose, um, what I do is I perform a blood test um, and one it will do is to check your complete blood count to your CBC, hemoglobin levels, your blood iron levels and ferritin levels. Um, and then from that, we will be able to tell you if your iron level in your blood is low, right? And as a result, then can tell you if you have a deficiency. So healthy and low iron um, studies in adults will say, okay, if you have iron, you're normal um, and the gayness is in adults, you're in a normal range of anything between 10 to 30 um, and you'll be classed as deficient or iron deficient anemic if you have less than 10 units, right? Um, if you have a ferritin level, men need to have anything between 40 to 300 and women anything between 20 to 200, um, but you'll be classed as deficient if you have anything less than 10. Right. Now we're coming to what I do, right? So how is iron deficiency anemia treated? So there's obviously several treatment options available. And the most common one and one uh, that everyone can do from the comfort of their own home is, aside from food, is iron supplements. So could also be called iron pills or the oral iron. And if you're really, really deficient, chronically deficient, uh, the doctors will prescribe you a very high, strong dosage of um, iron supplement. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm talking so much. My voice is breaking. Um, so this is the most common treatment for iron deficiency. So it can often take anything between three to six months to restore your iron levels. Um, and it will be good that if you're pregnant, you can also uh, take iron supplements during pregnancy but just obviously get the consent and a-okay from the doctors as well that's managing you throughout your pregnancy um, but of course talk to them if you experience side effects and another side effect um, of overconsumption of iron will be these couple of not nice things such as having a bad metallic taste in your mouth vomiting diarrhea constipation upset stomach all the stuff that i like to work with <laughs> Um, but usually the common problem I see with people is if you start to experience that most people also don't know is that you need to take certain supplements at certain times of day. Some of ones that are going to give you energy. So you should take uh, them more towards the morning and early hours of lunch. Some need to be taken with food, some to be taken without food as well. Um, but Usually if it's some supplement that can be taken as well, can be taken with or without food. But if you tend to take it without food and you feel symptoms of nausea and discomfort, then first, rather than stopping it, take it with food first, right? Or lowering the dosage because sometimes there's an adjustment period that your body might be struggling with. And rather than not taking it at all, just really try to um, wean yourself onto it rather than completely stop it in its entirety because some people just go like oh it made me feel so sick I'm never touching it again and therefore still experience the problem they have and in this context anemia right so there is ways around it but just slight adjustments now working with your individual vehicle um or the most obvious other one would be taking just a different iron supplement and this is where the kinesiology comes in that I do is that we ask your body what it needs and if it needs iron then we ask your body what supplement is it happy to take because we've got to think about how it was made the composition um as well as all the different fillers and makeups of it and maybe you have a problem with um because most iron supplements these days comes with vitamin c but there's different types of vitamin c um that most people don't know about um and maybe that vitamin c that's combined with that iron your body doesn't agree with or maybe where it was sourced from another country the iron blah 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 um, your body doesn't resonate with. So the kinesiology, uh, which is a muscle testing therapy where we can use supplements on your body to see which one your body resonates with, um, we can assess which is the right iron supplement for your body type. Another very common one, and hence why I've brought this podcast up this week, is that because I'm doing this like really many, many, many times in a week now, is treating people with uh, iron uh, drip, right? So Again, 
weird, but it is what it is. Some places you just go like, can I have an iron drip? They'll give you an iron drip, um, but they don't give you any iron drip administered with vitamin C to support iron absorption. So people now are being, I'm going to use the word conned, into going to pay for a drip, um, but then they just will pee it out because whatever your body doesn't absorb, you're going to release and uh, through drips, it's going to be through urination. Um, so what I do is in my um, clinic, I will administer first a bag of strong vitamin C um, and then people can choose to add this on depending um, on their reason for deficiency but can add on like adding B9 and B12 additional into their bag because then that can support red blood cell formation and recreate more red blood cells and phosphorate. and then we do the iron bag as well. The drips um, not uh, it is quite a long time, can average between two to three hours of administration because iron is heavy, it's metal, um, so it takes time for the body to absorb it um, and take it in, right? So let me just re-explain what it is. So an intravenous is basically um, where we put iron into your body through one of your veins. So it's going to be a needle, most popularly through the like elbow area, the antecubical fossa, where I'll be putting it through your vein. Um, and this helps to increase your iron levels in your blood. Most people say to me, how many sessions do I need? So at minimum, I notice people need about three. It will depend, subject to your blood test, your level of deficiency. If you're absolutely chronically low, you might need to have more. But what we will do is we'll do a, r- a round of drips and then subject to another blood test to see how much you've absorbed and obviously putting you on an iron supplement throughout that period. Um, and then we can take it and play it by ear. Because it might be a case of that. You might do a few and then you're good. And then you maintain with um, supplementation and food or diet. Or it could be a case of that you need to have iron drips permanently. Because maybe you're a female suffering with gynecological health issues. And every month it's like you bleed for three to five people Um and then you're chronically deficient. So you might need to replenish. Of course, in the interim, try see if you can find the root cause of your gynecological issues. Um, and obviously then you're treating that as the root and then you won't be bleeding out as much and therefore not losing your iron. Um, but of course, case by case, we need to work with treating both. So, you know, people, um, like I say, could be a, just a minor issue. Maybe you've had a surgery, blood loss, then you do one drip. But if it's different reasons, maybe because of your your choice of um, lifestyle with regards to food or severe bleeding etc then yes then you'll need to do a series of minimum of three subject to more and then maybe every two to three months or three months subject to a blood test right but of course the people who have very serious um, deficiency who have long-term conditions are more likely to receive um, more regular drips um, and it can be said, I haven't had this in my clinic, so I don't know. And maybe it's to do with the fact that I do a bag before and help the people absorb it better. But side effects can include maybe vomiting, headaches right after the treatment. But this will usually go within a day or so because the body's not used to maybe that level of blood. Um, if you so choose to choose the allopathic route, you can get medicine or medication called an ESA. Um, which is an erythropoiesis stimulating agent, which helps your bone marrow to make more red blood cells um, if this is causing your iron deficiency. So these medicines usually are used with iron therapy in people who have both iron deficiency anemia and are chronic long-term condition um, sufferers, like such as the kidney disease, as I mentioned earlier. Um, another one will be to do a blood transfusion. So again, allopathic route. Where you get quickly, um, you quickly get an increased amount of red blood cells and iron into your blood, um, and this may be used to treat serious iron deficiency. So again, that's sort of the allopathic route. Um, and then, of course, if your blood loss is a result of internal bleeding, then allopathic route again, surgery, get that fi- thing, get it sorted, get that thing fixed, get it sorted. Um, so to the prevention of your internal bleeding. And therefore, you won't be leading to iron loss, right? So that's quite straightforward. So in addition to all of the above, um, like everything that I do, you will be (laughs) completely overhauled and viewed and seeing how your lifestyle, your habits and everything are. Um, And then, of course, we'll be encouraged and invited to adopt your eating habits. And of course, um, 
I would also say, you know, what kind of other foods that are iron rich that might be encouraged. And I think a really, 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 really good one is eating actual liver. Now, I am in two minds about the liver because of the fact that liver is the organ that holds the toxins. And then there is a debate, um, not a debate, but a argument raised by someone very popular called the medical medium um, who has said that it is bad to eat liver because it's literally eating the toxins of another species of animal and you're putting more toxicity into your body and therefore creating more problems. Whereas on the other flip of the coin or the other side of the coin is that because the liver makes your blood, makes blood, um, therefore by consuming an organ of another species will be a fast, quick route to increasing your iron levels. So now... The next problem is, do you like the taste of liver? And liver has got quite a unique taste. It's very strong. I would call it astringent. It's very sharp for me. Um, But Nando's, I love Nando's. Nando's have a very, very delicious peri-peri sauce. And I used to audit Nando's, so I have a very different relationship to the average individual um, who likes Nando's. I... um, Yeah, I mean, I know I know the owners directly. So it was quite a a privilege to meet uh, someone who created something so amazing. And they do really have amazing initiatives and, you know, a lot of projects in place for community and um, charity and doing global great things with their work. So I really, really do root for Nando's. I am big thumbs up for them. Um. But they have this incredible starter called the Peri Peri um, Liver. It's a starter. And you can have that to try. Because at least if you don't like the liver taste, you will be tasting more of the Nando's Peri Peri sauce than anything else. So usually with people who have iron deficiency, I do recommend to them to actually um, go there for at least once a week. If, um, you know, not to, if not more if they can't one afford to and have the budget to, sorry, that's the same thing, if they have the time to, um, because cooking it at home is just not as delicious unless you're a good cook, right? But then equal, same thing, develop a skill, you can get better at cooking um, and just Google some nice recipes. But that will be good to add to your diet at least once a month, um, if not once a week, if um, you do have this problem. And it's actually quite cheap. Livers are really, really cheap, maybe because it's the reject... um, byproducts of animals so they're just trying to sell them off um so worth to consider um so yes and um one other fun fact that most people don't know is foods like black tea can actually reduce iron absorption so i know in the uk people drink black tea and coffee like it's going out of fashion but that's also another very interesting thing that I didn't know so I wanted to share that with you and then people and I have come across a couple of people so some people are unwell they have deficiency they've been tested and they've been confirmed through the health information tool that they're deficient and still choose to do nothing about it and they're like well if I've been functioning to date okay and I haven't been doing anything about it I'll be fine and the answer is just because you're okay now and as I always say you got to think about the long-term health implications and consequences of your choices today um so if you have undiagnosed or untreated deficiency um it could cause some serious health implications and the most obvious one is fatigue headaches restless leg syndrome if you don't know what that is it's like where your leg just seems to do its own thing all the time especially in more noticeable in bed so your partner hates <laughs> will hate on you and be like you're always moving in the bed or either kicking your partner um heart problems pregnancy complications or not being able to be pregnant or having miscarriages so it's not helpful and um it can also result in developmental delays in children. So you can also um, pass that on to your children and then they can have health issues. So if that's not motivating <laughs> enough, then uh, I don't know what else could be. So anyway, I don't know if that was a podcast, if that was a lecture. But anyway, <laughs> I have shared a lot with you today and I hope you enjoyed it. I do like iron. I'm 
obsessed with the liver. I really do think it's the root cause of a lot of issues. And when I said the gut is the root cause, just so you know, liver is part of the digestive system and highly influencing uh, or influenceable organ in the gut health department. So they are one of the same. Um, so, but yes, so I do think it's an important thing. So love your liver. Um, in Chinese medicine, the liver is responsible uh, for the color green. So if you want to feed your liver, eat green things, aside from actual liver and meats. Um, if you're out of balance with your liver, you will experience emotions of anger. So that's another interesting thing to note. And things like alcohol, as they always say in Chinese medicine, is harsh on the liver. And that's why when you drink, people become angry because it brings out the imbalance in the liver. And I think that's enough for today. But if you are concerned, if you are vegan, if you are vegetarian, if you have gut health issues, if you suspect you have parasites, if you know you don't eat enough meat, if you know you don't eat any vitamin C, sources of food or take supplements... If you are, uh, I'm trying to think of more examples now. If you are a martial artist or someone who <laughs> may be a bouncer or you get punched in the face all the time and you experience regular moments of blood loss. If you have uh, gynecological health issues, fibroids, any female health concerns where you lose excess amount of blood per month. Um, if you have just general concerns or questions after listening to this podcast but whether you have a deficiency give me a call or even yeah there's another one like I'm going back again if you're trying to get pregnant and it's not happening um if you've had miscarriage um if you think you're pale if you think you look pale if you find that you're struggling to walk up the escalators in the underground if you're struggling to exercise, if you find that you have shortness of breath for whatever reason when you try to exercise a bit, you find that um, you're quite uh, susceptible to being faint or you've uh, regularly fainted throughout your life or find yourself um, to be lightheaded or dizzy often or headaches, then maybe iron deficiency is something you have. And this is something I'd like to help you with. Um, obviously, if you're in another country, because people uh, listen to this podcast from around the world, step one, for free, try go to your doctor or GP and say, can I please have an iron test or ferritin test to assess my iron levels because I have some concerns about being iron deficient or have anemia. And then step two will be either to contact your local healthcare practitioner. And I've, I, of course, in terms of nutrition, can do this online. So I do online appointments all the time for nutrition and holistic health screening and using my quantum physics technology to scan your body through online work. Then I can recommend you certain foods, fruits, vegetables, um, nutrition. We can also do blood tests and the blood tests can be done um, from the comfort of your own home because uh, I have uh, the products that can be sent, the the labs, I have an agreement that can send it to your house. So you can do that from the comfort of your own home. So you don't necessarily have to come to the clinic. But if you need to be treated, then we can do a nutritional consultation uh, appointment that then can find out the lifestyle habits, where it's happening. You need to check as well if you don't have parasites or for whatever reason can be causing that blood loss. We can find the root, not blood loss, the iron deficiency, and whether you need drips, you need supplements, you need all of the above, um, you need gut health cleaning, uh, you need liver support, let me know. And at the Staff Road Wellness Clinic, we'll be more than happy to help you. Because the healthier you are, the more productive you are, the better our whole world becomes. So, you know, I really, really am on a huge mission here to make uh, quite an impact and I think on that note, if you're interested, so yes, you know, the website is www.starfroidwellnessclinic.com or info at starfroidwellness.com or the uh, business mobile number is plus four four seven three nine seven double eight double five nine zero. 
and we would love to help you at the clinic. So if you have any concerns, please don't hesitate because your health is your wealth and it is important to invest in yourself because everyone invests there's so much time and dedication towards their work and other things that are really fundamentally not important when they come to the end of their life. Um, but the most important thing being your asset, which is your body, you need to show a little bit more self-care, right? Right, so on that note, everybody, thank you so much for listening today. I think it was a longer podcast, but I think there was a lot to be said for that. Um, if you have any questions, as always, please email me through or contact me. A lot of people contact me on Facebook or Instagram or email um, or WhatsApp, actually. I'll be happy to answer your questions. So over and out, wherever you are in the world, I'm sending you so much love. And please stay tuned for the next week's, pos- next week's podcast. I don't know what it will be just yet. Um, as I say, I always work intuitively on whatever the theme is of the moment. But always, if I can, please request um, a vote of help is if you can please leave a five star rating so this podcast can be found by other people in the public so they can also get help and information. Okay, guys, have a good one. See you next week. Bye. I am your host, Star Friedenberg of the Star Freud Wellness Group, and I am consciously empowering your body and mind through wellness.